It's that time again. Welcome back to another stick shift. It's been a hectic week for me. Me and some of my colleagues from work were tasked to go to a local aircraft mechanic school and help out some of the students on some projects. And we are also getting prepared for the aerospace maintenance competition. So the schedule that I usually work got kind of shifted around. Oh, this work week is kind of spread out across uh, sporadic days. But don't worry, I got plenty of technical knowledge coming towards you here. We're gonna talk about a lot of fun stuff. Grab your bucket of popcorn and let's have some fun. While the jet bridge moves up, we gotta oil this beauty. She got a long, long flight right ahead of her. We'll get that taken care of, and then we'll go do a walk around. Let's go. There we go, got a nice surface up. A nice little look for you what it looks like underneath the fan cowl of a 777, well, G90. That's a big old oil tank. The GE90-115B has a maximum capacity of about 28 quarts or 26.5 liters of quantity of oil that it can hold. The oil tank itself is an aluminum structure. It also has a debris monitoring system inside of it and an oil level sensor. And as you can tell, we gravity feed the oil. Anyway, let's see now. Good. Go do the other engine and walk around. Pay close attention to those square panels. Those are actually doors. Be more specific, these are pressure relief doors. They open to release any kind of overpressure under the cowling. For example, let's say there was a burst duct inside of there. That would relieve the pressure from the core. Another interesting thing with these massive high bypass engines, not only to the GE90, the cowlings have very particular latches. They have to be opened and closed in a very particular sequence. If not done properly, it can cause damage to the cowlings. This is why everything is labeled and everything is numbered and we're following maintenance manual procedures. Beautiful, nice and healthy brakes and tires. That's what I like to see. I remember somebody asking me in the comments, how do you actually measure the brake wear? Well, majority of aircraft have a brake pin wear indicator. That's this little pin. It's attached directly to one of the discs. As the disc wears out, the brake pin wear indicator slowly goes inwards and goes flush. Well, we don't allow it to go flush. When we notice this or we're paying attention and doing our walk arounds, we will see it's getting close to flush. So now it's time to change the brake. There's limits to this. Very nice. This is the belly of the 777, and yes, it does look like an antenna, but it's not an antenna. It's actually a drain line. This is the APU fuel supply line shroud drain. Now, what do I mean by shroud? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a cover around the fuel line. Example, let's say if there was a leak in the fuel supply line to the APU, the shroud will catch this fuel and then it will drain it back down and push it overboard. You don't want any kind of fuel dripping in the cavities of the aircraft. So there's a shroud around the main fuel line in order to catch any kind of leaks and dump it overboard. It's for safety. 
pretty much all major aircraft have this. The 737 has this. Even the Airbus has this. I have probably talked about this before, but these are the negative pressure relief vents. These little doors open when the cabin pressure is less than ambient pressure. Prevents negative pressure in the cabin because too much negative pressure in the cabin is gonna cause damage to the fuselage. Then you got yourself positive pressure relief valves. This is if cabin pressure is higher than ambient. It permits air to leave the cabin. This is in order to keep the differential pressure at a safe limit. You can't overpressurize an airplane, you know what I mean? It, bad things happen. Get done with the outside, go back inside, and majority of the time, guys, you believe it or not, the airplane on the outside and internally, mechanically, is functioning fine, but the cabin items are always the thing that break the most. A simple thing such as a oven door latch just needed a little bit of tightening. Majority of the time, this is what breaks the most, interior cabin items. Uh-oh, somebody left a cookie in there. There we go. Beautiful. Status normal, my dog's good, oxygen good. You guys see me do this a million times. The service the engine rolls, those are good. Tire pressures, everything's good. Here's something interesting for you guys. Watch, this is the onboard compass, obviously. But watch, if I get closer, look what happens. Why do you think it's doing that? Because the phone has electromagnetic waves coming off it so it's affecting the, the compass so interesting right before you jump into the comments say that's affecting the compass no don't worry it's not remember this thing is surrounded by electromagnetic activity and pilots do have their own phones and they do have watches but it's just an example of a magnetic compass and how it can be interfered with i'm going to show you this on an airbus as well and there's a very interesting procedure that we do as maintenance which is called a compass swing Time to time, we do have to replace these compasses. Very particular procedure that we have to follow. So again, the procedure is called a compass swing. We have to take the aircraft into a very remote location where there's no electromagnetic interference. And we literally have to swing the whole airplane left, right, in all directions, just to make sure that that compass is reading correctly. All of these standby compasses also have a dedicated light. These are also no-go lights. I've talked about this before. When a pilot gets down to actually using this, this is their last resort of navigation. The holes that you see right up top over there, that's for adjustment. You saw it on the Boeing as well. The little chart that you see on the side, that's for correction for deviation. Every single aircraft has a magnetic compass. It dates back to the very first flight. Matter of fact, if I remember correctly, they actually used to call them whiskey compasses. As pilots would realize that regular water within the cavity of the compass would actually start freezing up. So what they would do is pour whiskey in it to prevent the thing from freezing. The compass has a very illustrious and very fascinating history. I would highly recommend for you guys to do some research and read on it. It's absolutely phenomenal. You were wondering what that little black thing is sticking down is? That's a microphone. It is for the CVR, the cockpit voice recorder. This is the thing that records onto the black boxes, which are orange, not black. Modern black boxes have progressed in technology. They're no longer tape recorders. They're solid state hard drives. The same for the flight data recorder as well. We record about 120 minutes of conversation within the flight. There's also a very specific time delay before and after the engine start. Simple terms, this thing is always recording. That's about it. Pretty much any modern aircraft that you see, the display units have very specific little sensors right there. These are photoelectric light sensors. They are installed on the faces of the display units in order to provide automatic adjustment of the display brightness when the light conditions change. 
combination with the manual adjustment brightness. It already always goes to the manual control. But as you can see right here, I can manipulate it with my flashlight. I can dim down the brightness of the display screen and simply shine a bright light onto it and you will see how it actually reacts. Pretty cool, right? I needed to get one of the vehicles fueled up and it's always fun to drive around and see all the beautiful aircraft that are around. If you're a Boston's fan, there you go. As always, cargo never disappoints. More Porsches. These are nice, these are classics. Carrera 2, another turbo. These are beautiful. This almost feels like deja vu or a rerun from last week. We saw a bunch of Porsches from last week and here's some more beautiful ones. I know there's a lot of people that are watching that are extremely awesome car enthusiasts, but I think you'll appreciate this one a lot too. This is a Mercedes and this is the AMG version and this is actually a very special package. This is an AMG, but not any ordinary AMG. This is the black edition. From what I understand, there's only 25 of them in the United States. Correct me if I'm wrong, I might be mistaken on this one. I think this thing costs quite close to $2.7 million. Still not quite sure on it. I might have done incorrect research, but correct me if I'm wrong, but it's still a beautiful car. Now you're gonna laugh at me. I know this Mercedes is beautiful and gorgeous and fast, but I'll still take that black Porsche right there, that turbo. That thing is a classic. But here is something really interesting I saw here. This thing is some kind of a classic. I'm not sure what this is, but it's in pristine condition. Love the color. Told you, cargo never disappoints. Like I said, cargo never disappoints. But on the way back, got to catch this beautiful Finnair A350 landing. I tell you what, you work on an airport, never a dull moment. You'll always have fun. Back on the line, airplane after airplane, they come in, they go out, they come in, they go out. It never stops. You know, this is one thing about the airport that's so fascinating. It's a 24 hour operation. It never stops. You might be a passenger, you might be getting on an airplane, you might be leaving an airplane, but the airport is always running. We're always running, we're always working. It's a beautiful symphony of metal, constantly moving and turning. People constantly working, making sure everything is right. Everything from ATC, pilots, ramp, mechanics, airport operations, everybody in between. Like, everybody is doing their part to make sure the metal moves. It takes an incredible amount of coordination just to get one aircraft out. Now, put that into a bigger scale. Multiply that by a thousand. That's what airports do every day. I had to wait for this beautiful 777 from Swiss Air to vacate the gate because our aircraft was inbound to the same gate. And it's always fun to catch a little time lapse of all the activity going around in the airport. Tell me, how many airplanes did you see taking off? Hey! 
Next level for you right there. So, in case anybody was curious how far you should stand away from an engine while an idle. This is the main gear of the 787 and the thing i'm pointing at right there is the tilt actuator this is what tilts the gear in order for it to simply fit into the wheel well the rest is massive electrical lines that power the electric brakes on this beautiful aircraft and here's a lovely view of the undercarriage nice I've talked about the NGS system, the nitrogen generating system on aircraft before. This is how it looks like on the 787. Well, one portion of it. This is on the right hand side of the belly of the 787. This is the Ram Air Overboard Exhaust. When the NGS system is on, hot air comes out of the heat exchanger and motor cooling the overboard exhaust port. Warm oxygen enriched air comes out of the air separation module and goes overboard. This is why you're seeing that trifecta of holes right there. One is for the air enriched air, one is for the motor cooling exhaust port, and one is for the ram exhaust muffler port. They managed to combine it all together and it worked perfectly as one exhaust port. Pretty cool, right? Alrighty, that's about it guys. This was a nice easy day. Nothing too exciting, had some fun. Schedule's gonna be a little weird for next week, but I will see you guys on the next adventure. So, later. Good morning, everybody. Woo, what a beautiful day. I love the smell of jet fuel in the morning. Smells like victory. Finally got me some cup of coffee. Let's go. Time to wake these beautiful jets up. Well, luck would have it. This one, this aircraft, the APU is actually on MEL. Yeah, it happens. I guess they just didn't have uh, parts or time to fix it, but this one's gonna need an air start. We'll check it out when they do it. So basically when the APU has no capacity to provide air to start these beautiful engines, you can use an external air source, which is that ground air cart right there. There's a plug at the bottom, we'll hook up and push air into it. There you go, hold on, you stay right there. I'll show you where it is. There it is. HP Air it goes in right there. And on next to it right here, this is for air conditioning. Oh yeah, they're gonna hook up that cart to this thing right here and give it some air. There you go, now it's all hooked up. And this hose will run all the way to the machine over here. And they're gonna start it up. Just for some context, yes, the auxiliary power unit was inoperative at this aircraft. It's okay to dispatch this aircraft with this on MEL, minimum equipment list. 
minimum equipment list is regulated by the FAA as well as IKO standards. You can dispatch aircraft legally and safely when certain components are not properly functioning. Remember, there's always redundancy behind this, but there are limitations to that as well. Once again, it's okay to go with some things that are not working. Now, this is our situation. Since the APU cannot provide air to start the engines on this aircraft, we need to use an outside source, which is a ground air cart. Ground air cart will supply the ducting with proper amount of air at the gate and provide the engine starter to start the engine at idle, not above idle. Once that occurs, the aircraft will get pushed back and we will do, they will do, or pilots, I should say, pilots will do cross bleed. Just watch. At this point, the engine is full sufficient. It's under its own power, but it's only at idle power. A ramp personnel will come over and disconnect that hose after obviously disengaging the ground air cart, after which they will disconnect the ground power connector from the aircraft. Because remember, the APU provides electricity and pneumatic source to the aircraft. If the APU is not working, you have neither. And by the way, APU is an auxiliary source of power. It's just an extra thing. There you go. The hose gets disconnected and now we get to push back. I'm not driving a tug. I am just a passenger. I just hitched along for the ride so I can show you guys what a pushback looks like. Once they got one of the engines running, they have sufficient amount of power because the engine has its own generator and it also can provide bleed air, which is any kind of pneumatic source that is needed. So this is why I say the auxiliary power unit is just an extra thing. Now, this is okay for short flights, uh, nothing too long haul. Anything beyond, I'd say, five and a half, six hours of flight, at that point, the APU will be critical, especially when it comes down to ETOPS flights, when you're going to extended operation flights, especially over long bodies of water or long bodies of land without any place to land. At that point, the APU pretty much cannot be... Uh, dispatch that's not operable it, you, you can't defer it for short flights it's perfectly fine there's plenty of airports to land on so this is what i'm trying to tell you don't panic when i say something is not working there's always rules and regulations to this so when i say cross bleed what does cross bleed mean that means you're tapping now off of the running engine you're tapping air off of that running engine and you're pushing it into the other engine in order to start it. When that happens, the running engine actually revs up just a bit more and you got to see that little cool effect right there, the vortex, vortex getting pushed in because the engine is actually revving up. Once that happens, the air gets pushed to the other engine and gets pushed to the other starter of the other engine and the other engine gets to start up. And that's a cross bleed for you. And you get to see that cool little vortex effect it goes to show how powerful these engines are. 
obviously, given the certain atmosphere conditions and uh, humidity. Okay, somebody in the comments asked me, can you go over all the placards and markings and the stickers? Obviously, I can't do all of them because there's too many of them, but I'll go over the important ones. The first one we're going to look at is underneath the wing, and it's right there. See that? For the fuel. This is actually a very important one. Matter of fact, the aircraft cannot go without that placard there. If it's missing or deteriorated, we would have to put on a some kind of a temporary template to make sure that data is there. 50 PSI max pressure pumping into the aircraft wing for fuel and 11 PSI, let's say if you're defueling suction. Makes sense, right? It's, it's self-explanatory. Next to it is the airplane nose number. That's how we keep track of the aircraft. Every single door, hatch, opening on an aircraft will have placards on it. Placards for, let's say, emergency exit and how to operate that door. Towards the empennage of the aircraft, you'll see the registration number and flag of the country of origin. Even the cargo doors, everything has instructions on it. That's the bulk cargo door, also instructions on it. Are you starting to see a pattern here? Notice that every single thing on aircraft is labeled. We're gonna take a quick little segue from placards and because somebody wanted to see what the flight data recorders actually look like. My apologies on the quality of the video. This is old footage, but it gives you an idea what the black boxes look like. And there they are. They're orange, not black. It makes it easier to find. The metal cylinders that you're seeing right there, those are called underwater beacons. As soon as those things touch any kind of water, it will send out a signal. There's a lot more information that's got to do with this, but I'm going to stick to the basics. I'll make a dedicated video for this later. Along with other things in this compartment is obviously the horizontal stabilizer, ducting for the APU bleed air, and the big old famous uh, jack screw. In Airbus terms, THS, trimmable horizontal stabilizer. It moves the horizontal stabilizer up and down. Okay, back to placards. That's a drain mast. Why does it say hot on it? Because it's heated. Panels for lavatory servicing as well as water servicing. Yes, I know they're very close together, but don't worry, they don't intermix. Every kind of door panel for hydraulic servicing or any kind of maintenance that we need to do, it's all labeled. Not only does it tell you it's a hydraulic servicing door, but it'll also designate the particular system. This right here, what's underneath this little hump, is the rat, the ram air turbine. Moving on to the engines. All engines have placards and markings on them, either to designate hoist points or even warning labels to stand clear while the engine is running. The minimum distance is at idle. The red vertical line is the plane of rotation of the fan blades. It can also serve as a warning to not cross that plane of rotation because that's where the ingestion starts happening or the true suction of the engine. On the other side, you have the servicing door that has the type of engine oil that it's using and some basic instructions. Y'all getting bored yet with all the placards and markings? No? Okay, here we go. A couple more. Remember that warning label on the engine to stay away 15 feet away because that's the ingestion zone? That vertical line is the 15 feet away. That's 15 feet in front of the engine. So anything beyond, you know, or closer beyond that line, you're now going into the ingestion zone when the engine is running at idle. Around the various sensors, such as the AOAs, angle of attacks, the static ports, as well as the pitot tubes, all these things have little boxes around them. This is called the RVSM area. I've talked about this in the past and what they do and what they're for. That area needs to be nice and smooth and clean, no obstruction of airflow. And now finally onto my favorite placard of them all. Do you see that big red line right in front of the nose gear? Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the unemployment line. <laughs> Why do we call it the unemployment line? Because that is the maximum degree of turn the nose gear can do. When the aircraft is getting pushed back, as you saw earlier on a pushback, that tow bar should not exceed that red line. As soon as you exceed that red line, now you are damaging that nose gear, basically for your maximum angle of turn. Now there is a fail safe for this. Uh, the tow bar itself has a shear pin. Once the nose gear reaches its maximum angle, it can no longer turn, so that shear pin will fail and snap it to prevent further damage. It does happen time to time, but you know we have to do an inspection when that happens. Next office. There you go. This is actually good to go. It's a quick turn. I think somebody was asking. You know, some windows have window shades like this. This is on 3.7, obviously. But they also have window shades like this. Let's have rails up the top right here. Pretty cool. 
through the rest of my flights, I actually managed to meet one of the pilots that watches my videos, which is kind of funny. We had a brief moment to talk, but it was fun. It was a pleasure, sir. And I promised you I was going to catch your takeoff. And here it is. I'm not going to mention your name, but this is you taking off. Enjoy. Okay, back to the more technical mumbo jumbo. Let's go. Now pay attention here. I've talked about this before. Do you see that probe or that piece of metal that's sticking out in the inlet on the 12 o'clock position? That is called the P2T2 sensor. It measures inlet pressure and inlet temperature. Also to remind you, this is a V2500 engine which has lots of Rolls-Royce influence. That means this engine runs off of EPR engine pressure ratios needs to collect data from the intake as well as the exhaust and send it to the EEC which is the electronic engine control unit to give the engine proper performance now here is what I want to show you exhaust sensor you see those spokes or rakes do you see those little tubes that are sticking out there's three of them like that watch you'll see it one at four o'clock seven o'clock and ten o'clock positions sensors are called the P4.9 sensors. They measure total pressure of the exhaust gas stream. Collect all this data in combination with the P2T2 sensor and send it to the EEC. Take these readings, convert it into a digital format, send it up into the flight deck to the ECAM, and it will represent the EPR for the engine, for the pilots. There you go. Airbus 321 and that is the APU intake door you later on what it looks like when it's closing but this is what I want to talk about right there that little red dot this is part of the APU fire extinguishing system APU is obviously another gas turbine engine and within that compartment you also have overheat detection sensors in case there was a fire within the compartment they would get notification within the flight deck and they can extinguish it with a fire bottle now this is where this little red circle comes into play the fire bottle the little thing is is a discharge indicator as well as a pressure relief device for example if there was an overheat condition or some kind of an overpressure condition within the bottle, that little disc will blow out and it will vent the contents of the bottle overboard, which is usually Halon 1301. The disc will also blow out when the fire bottle has been discharged. When we are performing our walk arounds, we're paying attention to that disc, making sure that it's there. If it is not there, that means the bottle is no longer serviceable. We need to address the situation, which is either usually changing the bottle or putting the APU on MEL. It's always fun walking through between the terminals, between terminal four and five. They got this big, massive tunnel. Looks kind of spooky, right? But it's pretty cool. They got really cool murals. And it's a little bit of a history of flight type of deal. Pretty cool, huh? I think this is my favorite one right here. I went over to Terminal 5 to visit some of my coworkers and say hello. 
You could use the outside on the ramp where you can just walk across because there's special walkways, but sometimes it's fun going down through the tunnels. And this is where also passengers can connect to terminals. I believe LAX just finished renovating a big portion of their tunnel systems and their network of walkways. I think now you can literally walk from Terminal 1 all the way to International, from International all the way to Terminal 7 or 8, I believe. It's completely open now. So if you got some downtime in LAX, yeah, definitely. I highly recommend walking through all the terminals and seeing all this fun stuff. But this one is strictly between Terminal 4 and Terminal 5. Walking through this tunnel makes me realize how far we have come within technology and just advancements within aviation. Majority of these advancements came through wartime, obviously, because that's where most progress comes from. It's kind of sad to think about it like that, but I try to think about it in a more positive outlook. We can enjoy flight as of today because of the sacrifices of yesterday. It's not a good justification, but I have to think positive. My only mindset would be if great minds could come together and put together something beautiful for a better tomorrow. Well, I am totally out of airplanes to fix. Everything's gone. That means I get to go home, right? <laughs> now it's a short day today. I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Welcome back, everybody. Let's go. One more day of adventure. As I mentioned from the beginning of this video, the week had been a little bit hectic with the scheduling, so my days working were kind of all over the place. We'll try to keep you guys posted on all the fun adventures. Here's a good look for you for the APU door, the intake door, look. They just shut it down. That's how it closes. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Once again, another Airbus. The APU equipped on this one is the Honeywell 131-9A. That little shield you see in front of the door is to prevent ingestions of fluid into the APU intake. Fluids such as any kind of water that gets ingested or any kind of glycol from the de-icing fluid. Believe it or not, even whatever is dumped into the galley drains because the galley drains go into the drain mass and go overboard. There's also a slight problem on the drain of the APU itself because sometimes that drain also leaks either fuel or oil that is excess and it kind of gets reverted and gets sucked back into the APU intake. So also another small little problem, which are all on the belly. Here's the problem with this design of APU door. This particular APU, or especially on the Airbuses, a very high tendency of getting odor in the cabin. Remember when I told you the APU provides pneumatic source of air, and this is on the ground when it can provide pneumatic source of air for the air conditioning. So this is how you get your odor in the cabin. Airbus has been playing around with the design and they are actually redesigning this. Believe it or not, it, this is not the APU's fault. The actual APU itself, the Honeywell 131-9A is an excellent APU, but that design of the inlet is not so well. So what Airbus is doing is actually taking that door and putting it up top. The future generation of the Airbus 320 family, you'll start noticing that the APU door is going to be on the top side. It's going to almost look like, almost exactly look like the 787 or the 777 APU intake door. But for now, until all the retrofits and all the modifications have been made to the, all the fleets, right now it's just got to be like this. But it's paid attention to its monitor in case there is some kind of a odor within the cabin. Maintenance is all over it and we do a thing called a burnout basically run the packs at extreme heat and to burn out any kind of residue or odor that's within the ducts. I just noticed this. So this is an old America West 319. <laughs> I got it. I've mentioned this before, but look at this. Poor thing. That's America West colors. That's US Airways colors. And obviously the current one. But yeah, they just kept painting it over and over and over again. I, I don't know why they did this. I, I, they should have just stripped the whole airplane and repainted it, but yeah. Probably somehow affects the weight of the aircraft, but not that much, I suppose. Look, I know paint of the aircraft affects the weight, but I am by no means any kind of expert. 
I'm sure there are people, engineers, people way above my pay grade that know more about this and have done the calculations and they said, yeah, it's fine. Just paint over the old one. I'm sure they sanded it down and whatever. Look, I'm not a, a painter or aircraft painter. Uh, if anybody here is an aircraft painter, please go ahead, chime in. But I'm just telling you, I don't know the specifics. I'm not knowledgeable on it. All I know is they just kept painting over and over and over again onto the old paint. And that's just the way it turned out. Obviously, the airplane is getting a little bit old. It's chipping off all the new paint and the older one is getting exposed. But, you know, my point here is it's pretty cool to see the heritage colors of the original aircraft. But the rest of the science and the numbers and the weight, don't ask me. I don't know. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's three different airlines for you in one airplane. Yeah, that's an old one. 2000. Look at that. Just even an un unenhanced uh, FAP flight attendant uh, panel. So this is the classic generic one. That's funny. We can perform tests through here for your directors and DEUA, DEUB. Also goes through, let's see now, you can check out the loudspeakers and I believe it has a signal lance and drain mast. You can basically do operational checks and make sure everything's functional. But yeah, this thing is so old, I think it even, okay, so it has the ovens, so these are your standard ovens. But this, yeah, there it is. Everybody might think this is an oven, right? It's not. It's actually a bread warmer. That's all it is. It's a bread warmer. <laughs> yeah. Don't see many of these around. Pretty cool. Or bun warmer, correctly. Excuse me. <laughs> bun warmer. Alright. Go through the walkthrough real quick and make sure things okay up there. Out of a 319 and into a 321. Meow. <laughs> oh, you know, somebody asked me. Um, how do the flight attendants know who rang the call button? Watch, I'll show you. Let's say right here. C33 Alpha, right? Let's see if we hit that one. Watch this. Go back here where the flight attendants sit, and there's a little panel right here. Ta-da! That's how they know exactly where you're calling from. Easy. And the way they reset it, that's why you always see your flight attendant come up and just Hit the button once again. Gone. But yeah, that's how they know who called. I still find it comical that they still have ashtrays, not only in the flight deck, but also on the lavatory doors, inside and outside. But here's a fun little one for you, which you probably talked about again. But the older Airbus 320 families, used to actually have an ashtray right there. That's actually for an ashtray holder, but they removed it since. Now pilots use it to uh, put in their cell phone and uh, their spare change or <laughs> something. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that, that used to be a ashtray holder. Here's a difference that I was talking about earlier. The enhanced model versus unenhanced model. For the flight attendant panel, obviously. Good. And then you have other menus here you can go into, mostly maintenance stuff. Since I was working in international terminals, I always get to see these beautiful aircraft roll in. A Lufthansa A380 and right next door, a beautiful 747-8 that had just pushed out. Absolutely gorgeous. I love seeing this stuff. Two of the biggest airplanes in the world right next to each other. How amazing is that?
next up. You can see this week was again unusual and I didn't get to work any wide bodies. I don't pick the airplanes I work on. The crew chief that is assigning me the work or the gates that I'm working, that's how I get assigned the work. So whatever comes into my gate, that's what I have to work on. Looking good. Nice clean blades. Check it out. When the fan section spins, also your low pressure turbine spins. Very quick description on a turbine engine and its functions. Most of these high bypass turbine engines minus the Rolls-Royce side because those are triple spool. Majority of them are dual spool. There's two shafts running through, okay? You have the low pressure turbine spinning the fan blades, which is the low, pr low pressure compressor. And then you have the high pressure turbine, which is in the core, spinning the high pressure compressor, which is all those tiny little blades. I've shown it before, but in just that's how a turbine actually works. One end spins the other, and there are independent shafts. Pretty cool, huh? That's a beautiful engine. Next office. All right, let's see. This one is good to go, but there was one little small issue, which was actually this dome light. Okay, this is gonna be a fun one because it involves a first officer that brought the aircraft in. So anyway, long story short, the first officer was still in the cabin or in the flight deck and I walked in, introduced myself. Hey, how's it going? How's the airplane? Just a quick little debrief. And then he recognized my voice. He goes, wait a minute, you're the YouTube guy, aren't you? And I said, yep, that's me, red-handed, caught. But anyway, we talked a little bit. It was a pleasure to meet you, sir. I hope you do uh, watch this because it's going to be funny. And he was telling me, look, uh, I was about to write up this dome light. The dome light has an issue. I think uh, the, the, it's on. It's not working on dim mode. And the dome light on this aircraft, the Airbus aircraft, is actually a no-go light because it's directly tied into the hot battery bus. It acts like an emergency light in case all power goes down. Let's say all power you have zero power you're now running on just pure battery power that little light has to stay on because while the pilot is flying the fo is navigating and the uh, first officer needs light basically well let me let me rephrase this they need the light in the past because in the past pilots didn't have ipads and all this fancy doodads it was actual charts so the first officer would crack open the charts they were reading it they needed the light uh, the funny joke behind this one, uh, well, well, with us maintenance, I don't know if pilots make this joke at all. Uh, we call it the Bible light because when the pilot is flying, the first officer is praying. It's a joke, guys. Don't take it too serious. Anyway, point being, it is a no-go item, uh, especially in nighttime operations, light. It has to work. It's a super easy change. It's just a couple of light bulbs. So uh, the first officer tell me, tells me about it. He's like, I'm about to put it in the book. I was like, don't worry about it. He looked tired as it is. He had a long haul. I said, go, go get some rest. I'll take care of it. I inputted it into the logbook and I went ahead and changed out to bulbs. So there you go. That's the context of the story. I talk too much. Oh my God. This is the FO's dome light and it has two settings. Let me show you. Up here, you got bright, dim and off supposed to be functioning on all right or well, dim and bright obviously but well, watch what happens when i put it on dim yep that one's on but that one's not a couple of the light bulbs are out so there you go look and actually that is a no-go item i gotta change that bulb so it's easy to do watch i'm gonna pull a breaker and then we'll pop this panel off which is a couple of allen keys Right here and this thing slides off you'll see it it's super easy following aircraft maintenance manual procedures pulling the proper breakers and deactivating the system i can proceed on taking the panels off okay those are loose there you go 
see, just an overhead panel. Put that right there. Oh, that's my hat, no worries. Then we find the bulb that's bad and we change it out. Easy. There's four bulbs in there and uh, three of them were bad basically. The reason I'm wearing a glove because I don't want to get any kind of grease or oils from my skin onto the lens of the bulb that will make it burn out or deteriorate faster. After getting the new bulbs installed, push the breakers back in and we do an ops check. Done. Yeah, don't like. There you go. Hell yeah. There you go. There we go. Let Come there be light. There. After that, put the panel back on, sign it off. She's good to go. A simple fix, but it's important, right? That's what we do. That's what we are. Saving the world, one airplane at a time. <laughs> I'm just messing. I love this job. And that is the conclusion to this stick shift, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this was the last airplane of the night. This was terminating because it's staying here overnight for maintenance. If you guys enjoyed this. I hope you guys had fun. I hope you learned a lot of fun stuff. I want to say thank you to every single one of you. I express my gratitude for being here and watching. Remember, always keep looking forward, smile, life is good. I'll see you guys on the next adventure. Take care of yourselves.